go. Well, you have one, you have a CTF already coming up. That's free that you can join in. Uh, you can also do NCL, yes. NCL and Pico. Cool. Well, this is week number four. We are a quarter of the way through the semester. Believe it or not. Hopefully you were able to get through the autopsy section quizzes, all 15 of them. If not, keep going. As always, there's no penalty for being late. Just do them as you can. Those are all in module three. And today we'll continue into module four. This whole chapter is all about the lab and some of the requirements that you'll show up, that'll show up if you decide to make one or join one. Uh, for example, there is the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors or the ASCLD, a nonprofit organization that provides guidelines and standards for labs. That way you don't have to create anything from scratch and have to figure everything out. Their standards will govern behaviors and practices of lab employees and their managers with the code of ethics. The ISO IEC 17025 can also help in creating general requirements uh, for competence and testing in labs. Now you have your, your government and your private labs that exist. Uh, the private labs will make a profit through a client consultation, internal fraud or fraud suffered by customers. Banks and credit card companies have their own internal practitioners. All major accounting firms have labs used to support investigations requested by clients. These fall under e-discovery, detection of electronic data for the purposes of litigation. A plaintiff, if you didn't know, is a party making the claim against another party and initiates the lawsuit, can request an electronically stored information such as email, Word documents, spreadsheets, databases, and all that kind of stuff. Under Sarbanes-Oxley, one of the laws that you should be familiar with, a publicly traded company must maintain all electronic information for a specific period of time. Retention time for documents is dependent on the type of document and the industry. US companies with European ties have to also adhere to GDPR. Sometimes the Security and Exchange Commission or the SEC will issue a 10 day notice to a publicly traded company to reduce documents pertaining to an investigation. E-discovery generally requires the expertise of forensic investigators IT staff and corporate lawyers. Forensics and IT locate evidence and ensure it's acquired properly, and the lawyers will determine the value of the data that's extracted. So within the lab, we have the evidence acquisition, of course, uh, getting info from, uh, you know, from any kind of media. Uh, we also have email. You'll ha have a lot of inventory to deal with. You'll have uh, management systems and web hosting uh, in case like the plaintiff and defense need a uh, easy access to the evidence in a safe and secure manner. Now this is an example layout. I mean, I just, I grabbed this first picture off of Google one of many that you can search for a digital forensics lab. This is just an example. You have your workstations where you acquire your, your evidence image files. 
Uh, all computers should be password protected with MFA. I mean, ideally. Obtaining a powerful system will increase examiner productivity. Uh, using things like forensics recovery of evidence device workstations could help. You have your workbench uh, where you can acquire your, or sorry, your workbench prepares hardware devices for investigative analysis with things like rubber mats to ensure no static electricity. Uh, they should have ample space to disassemble a computer and enough lighting uh, to safely work and take all the photographic evidence. You should have a mobile device examination workbench because they are, you know, mobile devices are super prevalent and not going anywhere. So not only should you have an area for your regular devices like computers and laptops, but you should definitely have a mobile forensics workbench area. Um, next cloud may not be secure enough for something like evidence. Uh, it all depends on the setup, of course. So I wouldn't say yes or no, but uh, don't just assume a product will work uh, off the bat. You definitely need to do some configuration or just make one up yourself. So here are some, some uh, stuff to have in your mobile forensics area. You know, things change as time goes on and you have different, different uh, phones to work with. Your field kit storage unit will help you do on-site collections as CSI or crime scene investigators. You know, it should have hardware and software tools that you'll need. And everything from sanitized drives to Faraday bags to sticky notes, everything you would possibly need to go on site and take an image from anything. Uh, mobile devices, for mobile devices, you should have a Faraday room or box or a bag, any, any way to prevent the mobile device to talk out, uh, uh, out to the world. That way, whatever's on the device can't be changed after the fact. And of course, an evidence locker, uh, a safe, secure room to store all the evidence and prevent it from getting out. There are all kinds of cloning devices and every lab should have these. Uh, they're, they're, they're built in ripe lockers that allow you to make copies of a drive without altering the drive. There's also another, uh, another stick that you could use for SIM cards as well. You'll need plenty of harvest drives where you uh, dump the, the copy or the image of the drive you are copying that you're gonna use for evidence. Toolkits, definitely need a toolkit. You don't know what you're gonna work with. So having, having as much stuff as you need all together will be helpful, especially in uh, a case where you have to move quickly. Flashlights, of course, because not everywhere is properly lighted and suspects may try to hide evidence like a little SD cards or flash drives or whatever. Uh, digital cameras, if I haven't already said that before, with plenty of uh, power to take as many pictures as needed. Uh, evidence bags, as shown here, to keep chain of custody, because that's gonna come in play when we go to the court. On the software side, of course, you need things like, uh, like autopsy or iLook, DriveSpy, FTK, NCASE, whatever the whatever you use. Uh, definitely virtual machine software to test malware code, uh, antiviruses, password cracking software, all that kind of stuff. Your photo forensics, whatever tool you're going to use to extract photos should be able to take as much information out of the photos as possible. 
that will come very useful in your reporting to, to the court. And then all other things that are miscellaneous, but not at the same time is the energy requirements. Because um, you know, copying drives and doing forensic evidence and processing, all that takes a lot of power. So making sure that your lab has enough power to do work at full capacity is definitely necessary along with any uh, backup generators and UPSs. Uh, having ABC extinguishers is suitable in your lab along with things like anti-glare screens, adjustable keyboards and other ergonomically friendly furniture. And a budget because a crime lab is expensive. You're gonna buy a lot of, of uh, software licenses, uh, continuous education, materials and equipment. Uh, oh, I have a question. Should you have all the software you need downloaded ahead of time? Absolutely. Uh, yes, you assume that when you go to the site, you won't have internet access. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, you want to have everything in your in your go bag ready, 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 downloaded, updated. Uh, laboratory management. Honestly, only the people who need to be in there should, and that list should be really tiny. It should only be whatever uh, managers. Uh, run the lab and the, the actual technicians who run the lab and nobody else, not even uh, anybody in the C-suite, uh, nobody, nobody else, nobody else. You want to honestly minimize the amount of people that come in. Think of uh, if, if it was COVID forever in the lab, you really want to reduce the amount of people working there. And you want to keep track of everybody who comes in and out. So this, this lab should definitely have no physical way for people to enter other than through the approved entrances. So for example, it shouldn't have any windows. It shouldn't have any false ceilings. Um, it shouldn't have any, any other way other than one door, really. Because again, you want to reduce the amount of ways that somebody could get into the lab. Uh, so you should be well versed with things like uh, DD and, and DC3DD and all kinds of other Linux tools that are easy to use to grab uh, images and also other tools like FTK Imager and whatnot, because you don't know what you'll walk into. So you should be well tested, well ready. But switching gears for a bit into financial fraud. So using tools like the ones mentioned before, can help into digging in a suspect's drive to get information such as bank and credit cards. For example, there's a distinctive group of bank and credit cards that are issued through banks like Amex, MasterCard, Visa, or issued directly to the customer without a secondary bank like Discover. Capital One is an example of its own category as it is a bank that issues its own credit cards. When searching for credit card numbers on a computer, it is helpful to know how the numbering system or the major industry identifier works. So major industry identifier of three is a travel and entertainment and banking financial. And those will normally be American Express and Diners Club. Any a card that starts with four or five will be banking financial. If it's a four, it's a Visa. If it's five, it's MasterCard. If it's six, it's Discover. The issuer identification number refers to the first six digits of a credit card. So if it's American Express, it'll have three, four. If it's Discover, that'll be uh, six, zero, one, one or 6440 through 6599. If it's a MasterCard, it'll start with 51 through 54. And if it's Visa, it'll start with four. It 
if we're dealing with things like check fraud, an American Bankers Association number, or ABA, is found on checks and indicates how this financial instrument is to be routed through the banking system. The first two digits correspond to a Federal Reserve Bank. An investigator can quickly ascertain the exact bank and branch for a check uh, by going online. And having, having these numbers will help you know where that bank went. So if you're doing an investigation and it deals with finances, you can help uh, the lawyers and, and others involved start directing where, where money went by using this information. If you, can, if you can bring it up, they can take that next step of asking like the Federal Reserve Bank in Richmond because the money went through there to see where, where did it come from, where did it go, so on and so forth. It starts that, that process of tracking down uh, where money went. There are also these annoying things, skimmers. A skimmer is an electronic device used to capture data from the magnetic strip on a debit, credit, or prepaid card. They are used by identity thieves worldwide. Generally, they're battery operated and they're easily purchasable online. You have uh, like parasite skimmers, which are used on point of sale systems. It can either compromise the terminal or be a phony terminal, capturing the data but does not function as a payment system. They can be Bluetooth enabled to remotely transfer the data. They generally have fake or paper thin keypads that sit under the legitimate keypad and capture pins. And there's also uh, on ATMs, you could do a false front with a tiny camera to capture the pin. This one is an example of a mag stripe encoder. Uh, the, that will read the, the card. Um, actually, earlier today, I put, I found a, uh, an article about uh, a, a new skimmer using Bluetooth. Where did it go? Aha. From Krebs on Security, actually. A Bluetooth overlay skimmer. Looks like your regular payment skimmer, but it transmits stolen data via Bluetooth. So that that um, the attacker is not that far away. Far enough to look like they're just an innocent bystander, but you know, close enough to uh, be able to hear this and record it. And here's the back end with, a, with its own battery, uh, the, the pins and whatnot. And apparently it also uh, ignores the, the chip so that it'll still read the, the mag stripe and still take the information out, but doesn't necessarily need to read the chip. Yeah, interesting. Uh, Interesting little suckers. So let's say you were the forensic investigator for law enforcement and you had a case regarding this thing and law enforcement was able to find who it is and stop them and, um, and acquire their laptop my guess is a laptop or cell phone, then it would show up to you in a, in a um, chain of custody bag. So you would start running through this, this either phone or laptop and start looking for the information I just mentioned or finding those specific numbers or start with numbers and running a keyword search. And if you start pulling out numbers for discover credit cards and, and visas and whatnot, now you, now you can build that that profile of, yes, this person was capturing all this information and, and here it is and start building that report to give back to law enforcement so they can, they can take it to the court. I'm pretty sure it does log the MAC addresses. 
because that's that's the easiest way to be able to remember a uh, a device to reconnect to it. But fun stuff. Um, questions? Or I should say other questions. Proving someone's phone is paired with the card skimmer prove they used it to find cards that were skimmed. Uh, well, getting proving that they're connected together would definitely be a start. But having having proof that it was actually used would solidify it. Because just like uh, with a USB drive. You know, showing that that um, that the device that the, this USB drive was connected to this system definitely helps in showing that there was um, the drive was there and it was accessed. So then the next step would be is to figure out uh, what user accessed what from that drive to continue uh, connecting the two together. Cool. I'll stop this real quick.